for Speed 5 was the last game of a certain breed of Need for Speed titles. This was the last one to be made by the original creators of the series, Distinctive Software, also known as EA Canada. After this, the series was taken over by Black Box, which made a few great games and, as you well know, ran the series into the ground, though this is mostly Electronic Arts' fault. Need for Speed 5, Porsche Unleashed or Porsche 2000, however you want to call it, is a unique game for the series. This wasn't just a racing game, this was a love letter to Porsche. It let you drive just about every car ever made since the end of World War II. Not just the good ones, the crappy ones too. This game was a history lesson and in that way it is unique for the Need for Speed series and in general for most driving games. This is something you don't actually see that often. Well yeah there may be some games like the Volvo game which was free that had one or two Volvo cars but this one had almost a hundred. There were over 90 cars. And while yes, some of them had very few differences between them, they had coupe models, they had cabriolet models, targa models, they were still distinct entities, distinct cars, which you could drive. And quite frankly, you could sometimes feel even the slightest difference in the way the cars move. The Need for Speed series has tried numerous times to approach a more simulator-like behavior for its cars. It makes sense because the people that created this series were the ones that made Test Drive and the first Need for Speed was made in collaboration with Road and Track which was an automotive magazine. But since Need for Speed 2 things went a bit arcadey. Not here though. Here the cars had something which I'll dare say most racing car games fail to offer the player. A sense that the car has weight. A sense that the car isn't just a box. You could feel the car shifting its weight in every turn. You could actually see, especially in the older models, the way the body shifted from one wheel to another when you went into a turn. Also, were you to break in a turn at that moment, the car would just go sideways. They had weight, they had inertia, they had feedback, feeling in the way they handled. Also, incredible force feedback. And I mean it, in this game you could feel the road, you could feel the weight changing. And for some reason, the force feedback doesn't seem to work on Windows 10. No matter how much I try to enable it again, I have no idea why it doesn't work. Looking back at this game now, as much as I love it, I can't help but find some faults with it. Some elements that don't work that well. The AI, for example, is always kind of predictable. There is gonna be three drivers that are at least capable. Two of them will keep going forward ahead of you and the rest will just lose. Unless you of course do something horrible. The game didn't seem to have the rubber banding effects that later games in the series had, mostly because you could actually see the times that each other drivers set. It tried to keep things honest. And for the most part this wasn't a game where you raced other people. Well yeah you did race other drivers but it was one where you raced the car, where you raced the tracks because that's where the most challenge came from. Not from overtaking the opposition but from just trying to keep the car on the track from trying to get a turn just right without slamming head first or side first into a wall. Because every bit of damage not only ruined the perfectly good body but also damaged the handling affected the engine decreasing the top speed and so on. The car would also veer to one side or another if you actually slammed headfirst into a pole. But it was okay because at the end of a race, if you still had some money left, you went back into the garage and just fixed your car. This is what I love about this game. Even though most of the parts you can buy are just statistically better versions of the old parts, making most of the old parts completely irrelevant, they were still there. You could make a car that had semi-racing springs or street performance suspension, even though you had professional racing gear already available. Yeah, it was more expensive, but in this game money wasn't that big of an issue when you went into the second-hand market where you bought cars, fixed them and then sold them at a premium. 
that may be considered cheating a bit, but it was part of the game, to a point it was intentional. And you can fix all those parts one by one instead of just pressing the big repair button. Or you could just swap out the old parts for new ones, better ones. And you also got to tune your car. This was the first non-Formula 1 racing game that I played in which you could set the tire pressure, where you could tune the downforce, where you could change the stiffness of the springs, where you could lower the ride height. Those settings, those sliders actually did something. They didn't just change a number on the screen and make your car go faster or slower, no. They fundamentally changed the way it drove. I managed to get a car that was so unstable that just accelerating would cause it to spin like mad. Also got one to, when I pressed the handbrake, to do a 360, all by just changing the tire pressure and the downforce and some of the steering. Now the game didn't do that good of a job at explaining how all those sliders worked, but what it did do a good job of was teaching you how to drive, because this game not only had a single player, a multiplayer, in an evolution mode where you got every car Porsche ever made through time, from the 356 to the 911 from 2000, but it also had a factory driver mode, where you would play as a test driver for Porsche. It started with exams, it started with teaching you how to drive, with letting you learn how to slalom, how to do a 360, how to take an S-curve, how to do so many things. Sort of like the driver used to do. Remember the tutorial to driver? Driver didn't have a tutorial, it had a challenge. The first thing you do in driver is prove that you are better at this game than someone that has just started playing it. Which is sometimes quite impossible. Need for Speed 5 had a more forgiving approach, but one that still, with time, challenged you to learn how the cars handled. And ironically, even though this game had about as shallow of a story as you can get because it didn't really have one, it just had dialogues with the other drivers and mechanics at Porsche, it's about, well, the best well-told story in a Need for Speed game. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Mostly because there's no bullshit in it. You're a driver. You have to drive these cars. You have to test them. At times, you'll have to deliver them. All while climbing the ranks in an attempt to become the new ace driver. It's simple, to the point, concise. I don't want to strangle any of the characters. It's the best story ever put together in a Need for Speed game. It's not completely pointless. It's not something I would want to be removed from the game because it's stupid. It just gives it more of an atmosphere, more of a sense of belonging to this brand. Because this game did a lot to teach you about the history of Porsche. It had an entire section dedicated to just showing you the cars with slides and pictures and posters and bits of magazines. It had for each and every one of them detailed statistics about everything you'd ever want to know about a car. They even had pictures for each and every one, several pictures for cars that at that time were 50 years old. Now they're pushing 70 and still they're a pleasure to drive because these cars weren't all about mm, speed necessarily, they were about handling, they were about feeling. They weren't about putting NAS on everything, wearing a sideways cap, listening to music and blasting it through speakers that are the size of a car. They were about the pleasure of driving. The game was about the pleasure of driving. And you can tell that because this game didn't take place in some city, some patrocity made of steel and cement. It took place in some of the most beautiful locations I've ever seen in a video game about cars. You had the Alps when going from one tunnel to another you'd get more and more snow until you just wound up in a snowstorm. You had Pyrenees which had this fantastic bluish tinted light at the start. Normandy, a superb map, the first one you go through, nice forest, farmlands, mountains, the Côte d'Azur, which again had a very beautiful seaside, Corsica, that forest one with a name I can't pronounce, 
the Autobahn if you just wanted to slam that accelerator and go as fast as possible. Though to be fair, even that track had some killer tones that could just wreck your car if you didn't respect them. And then there was Monte Carlo, the only tracks, the circular tracks like racing tracks in the entire game were the Monte Carlo variations. You could more or less take part in the Monaco Grand Prix or maybe just bits of it. And it's places like these that gave this game class, it gave it a style, it gave it a certain sense of refinement which you don't see in a lot of modern racing games or driving games, which is something I've mentioned in a previous show. And you would get to visit these tracks over and over again, even though in evolution mode they unlocked one by one from one generation to another, you still got to play them with all cars, because well, this game understood that, hey, maybe the player doesn't want to ditch their old car just because they have one now that goes twice as fast. So they had rally stages when you went to a new era where you could just take your old car again and drive it in a competition for old cars. And again, that's not something you see in a lot of games. In most of them, it's just whoever gets there first or in the first three. There's very little creativity to it. And I can't say that this game had it in space, but still, it had a sense, it had a style, it had, it had a spark that's been lost. And I believe that idea, that notion that something was lost, something was replaced, sort of fits in with the way that this game and the movie Gun 60 Seconds were promoted together. Because in that movie it was also about a bunch of old car thieves doing what they did for one last time and then letting the new generation put mass in everything. It was a generational shift I would say, from a gentleman's sport to street racing. A Need for Speed Porsche was a gentleman's sport. It had class. And it was supposed to be the final Need for Speed game. There was an interview on a show called Cybernet, which shared in the UK about 16 years ago, where it actually showed how this game was made. They actually showed how they scanned clay models into the game to get the cars exactly right. And at that time, one of the representatives of the studio said that this was the final Need for Speed game. That from now on, the series would be called Split Second. Now again, this was 16 years ago. There was a Split Second, but not made by Electronic Arts, and not really having anything to do with Need for Speed. But I still find it a very interesting fact that at one time this series was almost gone. But in a sense it was. After this came the Black Box era, which had some amazing games in it. Need for Speed Underground was good, I loved the customization of Underground 2, I adored the cop chases in 3D and let's leave it at that. But those weren't games that were made to teach you car history. Those weren't games made to give you the spec sheet for a 1986 944 Turbo. Those weren't the kind of games that let you race a car that's 70 years old against one that was made this year. I will show you to lose outright, unless your opponent is human and doesn't understand that. You see, in this game, you have to break before the turn, not in it. If you break in it, your car's more or less gonna flip, and you'd be surprised just how far you could go with that knowledge. Need for Speed 5 does take a bit of tweaking to get working on Windows 10. It worked by default on 7, the force feedback worked as well, but here, well, not so much. Electronic Arts isn't selling it anymore. I have no idea why. Maybe they don't have a license for the Porsche cars anymore. Or honestly, I have no idea if it's the license that stops them from selling the older games. Because if it is the license, then it's a real shame. But if it's not the license, then why isn't Electronic Arts trying to sell these games to us again? It's something Electronic Arts would do. And it's honestly something... I wouldn't fault them for it and actually I give them money. One can only hope that someday they'll realize that this game still has a place on the market today because 
it was unique. It still is unique. There are none like it. And considering the budgets involved in games today, even racing games, unless a car manufacturer just drives a dump truck of money to their door, they're probably not gonna make one like it again. One made to teach you the history of a brand of cars. One made to instill in you a better understanding of how cars evolved over the course of a half a century. So if by some fluke, some random chance, some twist of fate, you were to find Need for Speed 5, Porsche 2000, Porsche Unleashed, or whatever you want to call it, give it a try. Drive those old 356s that behave like they were boats sometimes and enjoy it. Because you're not gonna see something like this ever again. If you enjoyed this show, hit the like button, subscribe and share it with your friends. Or, if you thought it was horrible, then share it with your enemies and make them suffer. We shall be your weapon of vengeance. But if you liked what you saw, you could, I don't know, maybe donate because basically YouTube is horrible at revenue by using the link in the description or just buy my book. It's a fantasy book about, well, a lot of stuff. I guarantee it won't suck, and if it does suck, you can find me here and complain about it.